history class with Dr. W and our discussion of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. I've been talking in the last few lectures about immigration in the 1880s and 90s. And in this lecture, I'll continue discussing the so-called new immigrants, focusing on groups like the Polish and Russian Jews. There were too many different immigrant groups in this period for me to go over each one in detail. So I'll have to look at just a few representative samples. In this case, I'll talk about the Polish, who represent Eastern Europeans, which also included groups like Hungarians, Greeks, Russians, Arabs, and a few others. The Polish were among the largest from those groups. In terms of push motives for them, for the most part, it was an economic motive. They came for bread, as one historian has written. Between 1850 and 1915, there were about 2.5 million Polish who immigrated to the United States. About a third of them returned to Poland, uh, at least at one time or another. Many of them settled in the so-called Rust Belt. These were industrial cities filled by this time with old rusted factories. Some 400,000 Polish lived in Chicago by 1920, and others settled in Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Milwaukee, Detroit, or other places like that. So the Rust Belt is that industrial Midwest. They often had the lowest jobs, as one wrote, what people from America write to Poland is all bluster. There's not a word of truth. For in America, Poles work like cattle. Where a dog does not want to sit, there the Pole is made to sit. And the poor wretch works because he wants to eat. There was a cliche of the Polish being somewhat slow-witted. And many of them were ignorant. I don't mean unintelligent, but ignorant of American ways. They didn't know the language. Many of them were poorly educated, and they didn't understand the way of the big cities, which led to uh, the development of that cliché. Politically, like Italians, many of the Polish were more interested in Polish politics and Polish affairs than American affairs. There were many ethnic organizations. There were about 7,000 Polish organizations in the United States by 1910. There they would gather and talk about Polish politics, the establishment of a Polish state, and just the nature of things back in Europe. So again, there are many other groups we could talk about here. The Polish, in many ways, are representative of those Eastern European groups. A lot of them uh, suffered similar kind of conditions to the Polish. The other group I want to spend a little bit of time talking about were Eastern European Jews, most of them coming from Russia. Even with the addition of some Jews from Germany, there were only about 250,000 Jews in the United States in 1880. By 1924, there were 4 million, most of them coming from Eastern Europe, and most of those from Russia. So there were a number of push factors that encouraged Jews to leave Eastern Europe. So like others in the region, they endured a poor economy. And particularly in Russia, where there was a lot of persecution of the Jews, they were forced to live in a region called the Pale of Settlement, where overcrowding and over-specialization among Jewish workers left only limited opportunities. As one of them explained, it was not easy to live with such bitter competition as the congestion of the population made inevitable. There were ten times as many stores as there should have been, ten times as many tailors, cobblers, barbers, and tinsmiths. Another motivation to move was religious persecution. And after 1881, this persecution became much more pronounced. The numbers of Jews had increased dramatically during the 19th century, which only encouraged this persecution. And also, while few Jews were truly wealthy, uh, most of them were slightly above the poorest classes, which again led to persecution and in some cases envy. Churches and even governments also engaged in persecution of the Jews. 
the Russian government in particular sponsored pogroms and restrictive laws. Pogroms were massacres of the Jews and destruction of their shops and synagogues. So this was organized and very harsh persecution that left them uh, in a truly miserable condition. The journey and migration for Jews was among the most difficult of any immigrant group. They had to travel a very long way to get out of Russia and ultimately make their way to the United States. And Russian border guards and others along the way could be very cruel and difficult to let them pass. So Jews differed in some ways from the rest of the immigrant population. They tended to be younger between the ages of 14 and 40. Again, the journey was so difficult that folks older than that uh, often struggled to do it. They were more likely to have industrial skills, and most were literate. They were also very likely to stay in the United States once they arrived. Only about 5% of them returned, and some of those came back to the United States again. Uh, and again, that's largely due to the journey being so difficult. It wasn't the kind of thing that you were going to undo. And of course, the conditions in their homeland were so terrible, they weren't going to go back. We also see with this group larger numbers of females uh, coming with them and more uh, families and kind of steady relationships within the immigrant population in general. Overwhelmingly, the Jews tended to remain in New York City or some of the other cities along the East Coast. And most of them joined the working poor in those cities, living in the crowded tenements and the dumbbell tenements, which I'll be talking about in a future lecture. Unique among the Jews, they had a whole network of employment controlled by their own. Often Yiddish was spoken at all levels. As one 1905 observer said, almost every newly arrived Russian Jewish laborer comes into contact with a Russian Jewish employer and almost every Russian Jewish tenement dweller must pay his exorbitant rent to a Jewish landlord. Their labor focused on the garment industry. There was also a significant Jewish entrepreneurial movement and many Jewish business owners, but the vast majority were known as Jews without money. Also prominent among Jews were peddlers who were a common sight on street corners, particularly in New York City. Nonetheless, they remain a relatively small percentage of Jews themselves, although many of the peddlers themselves were Jews. Many Jewish girls and women worked in the garment industry, representing for many of them the failure of the American dream. They dreamt of education, a life of learning, and other opportunities. Instead, they worked in the terrible conditions of the garment factories. As one girl explained, she had dreamed of free schools, free colleges, where she could express her innermost thoughts and feelings to the world. Instead, off the ship she was driven to one of the sweatshops to become a hand, cramped, deadened into part of the machine. The Jews were mostly poor, raised in shtetls, self-contained rural communities. In the United States, politically, many of them became socialists on the radical fringes of American politics, and they were often involved in labor politics and leaders among the budding labor movement in the country. Jewish women at times led strikes in the garment industry, as they did in 1909. According to one poem describing the strike, in the black winter of 1909, when we froze and bled on the picket line, we showed the world that women could fight, and we rose and we won with women's might. After almost nine months of striking, which involved more than 60,000 women, the sides reached a settlement granting the women a 50-hour work week and wage increases. But most prominent organizations among the Jews were smaller organizations of those who had come from the same hometown over in Europe. They developed lodges called Landsmanschafts. In 1907, 
There were over 300 such organizations in the Lower East Side of New York alone, most having their own synagogue as well. These were similar to some of the other immigrant organizations we've discussed already, helping the so-called greenhorns, the new arrivals, finding jobs, providing them loans, and other kind of assistance. Jews eagerly participated in American education and often moved up the social ladder. They respected education and also didn't expect to return to Europe, so they dove into the American system. Also, they had to read to get through the bar mitzvah, their rite of passage. It wasn't always the first generation of my migrants who had such success, but often after a generation or two, Jews fully integrated into American society. Even in 1920, universities such as Yale and Harvard had to put a cap on Jewish enrollment because there were so many Jews entering. Ultimately, there were also many entrepreneurs who were involved in innovative businesses in the country. They became prominent in the theater industry and entertainment. Figures like Samuel Goldwyn, Harry Warner, and there were many famous Jewish actors and comedians, uh, including the Marx Brothers and many others down through the years. So these are a few of the immigrant groups among the so-called new immigrants and some of the conditions and challenges they confronted. I'll be revisiting some of these groups as we continue in future lectures, particularly the next group of lectures, when we'll be talking about industry, manufacturing, and the growing labor movement in the United States.